title of our message today is Our Book, Part 32. We'll be studying Revelation 12, 7 through 8. And I have a subtitle for you. It's WDIF. And you'll have to listen to the sermon to find out what that means. Revelation 12, 7. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought. We are still going to do what the angel told us. We're going to eat the little book that John took out of his hand. We're going to do that, but not yet. We will begin to eat the little book next Sabbath. But this Sabbath, I promised you, we would look at why Lucifer chose our planet. I mean, when he was kicked out of heaven, he could have gone anywhere. He came here. Why? That's what we're going to look at today. Let's pray. Father, as we look into your word, we recognize our tremendous need of your guidance. There's not an IQ on this planet sufficient to plumbing the depths of your word, unaided by your Holy Spirit. And so we invite you. Open our minds. Give us clarity of thought. Let us see clearly exactly what you would have us to know as you guide us into the path that you have chosen for each of our lives. It's a different path for everyone. You invested different talents, different abilities when you created us in our mother's womb. And you have a desire, you have a direction, you have a plan, you have an idea. You have a picture in your mind of what you would accomplish with all who are willing to be used by you. And today, Lord, we tell you we're willing. I particularly ask that you'll not allow me to interfere with what you're doing here today, God. Please allow your words to flow across my lips. Please touch my heart and my understanding as you do each one in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, war in paradise. Can you imagine it? I mean, we have war on planet Earth, sure. We have a lot of people who are warmongers. What is a warmonger? Well, believe it or not, anyone who puts himself first has the potential to be a warmonger. You put yourself first, and the first time you meet somebody who puts themselves first, there's going to be an altercation. And that's how wars get started. War broke out in heaven. Because one angel, think about that, in paradise, everything perfect, everything perfect, no death, no arguments, no disagreements, no hate, no pain, no suffering, no regrets, no heartache, no heartbreak, everything perfect, but one angel became proud, envious, and selfish. And it caused war in heaven. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. They just didn't fit. They no longer fit into the atmosphere of heaven. So what qualifies someone to fit in? That's really easy. The Bible tells us. God wrote it in stone. It's the commandments. And most people think there are ten of them, but there are only two. Only two commandments. Now, right now you're thinking of Jesus' words when he says, love your father, love your fellow man. Those are the two commandments. And all of the commandments are contained in those two. And that would be accurate. You know, Jesus did say that. I'm not going to argue against it. Love God. Love your fellow man. That is what Jesus said. But actually, eight are not even commandments. There are really only two commandments. On the tables of stone, there are only two commandments. Eight of them say, thou shalt not. And that is both a prophecy and a statement of fact. 
thou, you, and I shall not. They'll be kept by everyone. There's no question. Eight commandments will be kept by everyone. They are a prophecy. They are a statement of fact. Eight of them will be kept either when you're dead or when you're in eternity with Jesus. One or the other. I mean, when you're dead, how many people are you going to kill? When you're dead, how many lies will you tell? When you're dead, will you covet? When you're dead, will you take God's name in vain? No, eight commandments will be kept, period, by every person, either when you're dead or when you are living in God's kingdom. One time or the other, maybe both, because there will be a resurrection. So maybe both. There are really only two commandments, number four and number five. They don't say thou shalt not. And they both deal with things that were here before sin. Number four and number five both deal with things that existed on earth before sin. Both involve relationship. The fourth, a relationship with our heavenly family. Don't we have a father in heaven? And a brother in heaven? He asks us to spend time with him every week. It's like a date. You know, the family gets together every week. Do you ever have those in your family? Uh, I can remember growing up and, and uh, the family on my mother's side, once a year, we had a big family get together. Uh, it was usually in southern Illinois where, you know, most of the family was from that area and, and the rest would travel to that area and, and we would have a big picnic and the tables would be lined up I mean, it seemed to me like they went for a half a mile. I know that was just my little kid brain trying to take it all in, but there was more food there than <laughs> any of us could eat. Uh, always food taken home. And uh, people that I only met once a year, cousins, second cousins, aunts, uncles, you ever do that in your family? And I know doing it every week would not be feasible for us, but for God? God says, I'll be with you every week in a special way. And he set aside time for us to be with him in a special way. Remember the Sabbath day. It's a time for our relationship with our heavenly family. And then the fifth commandment, which is really just the second commandment, because the others are not commandments, but the fifth one is for our earthly family. Honor your father and mother. And hopefully that means when you honor your father and mother, you have modeled for your children, and they will honor you, their father and mother. And so that fifth commandment is really for our earthly family, but it, it doesn't stop with the immediate family. Let me ask you this question. How many people living today on planet Earth are you not genetically connected to? How many? None. <laughs> the human family is indeed a family, a family, one family. There's nobody on earth that you're not related to. And so what really happens is that heaven's love, when we have our relationship strong with our heavenly family, heaven's love flows through us into our earthly family. And that's really what the gospel is all about. 
loving people, letting them know that our Heavenly Father has a plan that includes them in eternity, in His kingdom. Now, i got to tell you, on this earth, I can understand suicide. I can. You can be pushed on this earth by events, by failed relationships, by financial difficulties, until it's just more than you can bear. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying I agree with it. But I can understand it. And so when I talk about eternal life, there may be people who say, I can't even stand tomorrow. Why would I want to be here forever? But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about forever like life is now. We're talking about a forever. You know, no matter how bad your life has been, I can promise you that if you search your memory, you will find a day when everything was perfect. I, I, I still remember the day I saw my wife. I remember everything about that moment when I saw her. What she was wearing, how she was moving, what her voice sounded like. It was, it was perfect. And I think every one of us has some memory, no matter how bad your life has been. And, and I, if I had time, I could tell you some bad things from my own life. But no matter how bad it's been, I think every one of us can find a moment, maybe even a whole day, when life was just great. The sky was a brighter blue, the clouds were a fluffier white, Everything was just the way it ought to be. And that's what we're talking about for eternity. Only you've got to take that, that perfect day that you remember, and put it on steroids, because heaven will be better. Heaven will be better. <laughs> and the earth made new will be better. So we're not talking about a life where you have to deal with all this stuff you have to deal with now. It's going to be a life that is beyond our imagining. It will be so wonderful. So, in the final analysis, what Jesus said really is true. You really could say, love God love your fellow man. Jesus went at it from a different direction. He was telling us that the first four commandments were about our love for God. And the last six commandments were about our love for fellow man, our fellow man. So this morning I went at it from another direction because eight of those are not even commandments. They're just prophecies and statements of fact. Only two of them are commandments. The two that don't say, thou shalt not. Remember the Sabbath? That was here before sin. It was the last day of creation when he made the Sabbath. It's why we have seven days in the week. If God had not created the Sabbath in creation week, we would only have six days in the week. But he created a day. Today is the Lord's day. It's the day that the Lord made. And He made it so that we could be close in our relationship with Him. So that every week there would be an opportunity to shift our focus back from the cares of this world to the things that really matter. So every week as we honor the Sabbath, the Holy Spirit has an opportunity to reestablish a proper focus in our life. And then during the week, what happens? Well, we all know what Monday's like, right? TGIF got its name from what Mondays are like. 
And then you have to deal with everything that comes up Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then, oh, thank God it's Friday. And then the Sabbath. When all of that is allowed to just slip away. I, I can't tell you how blessed I felt when it finally dawned on me. I mean, I, I was baptized when I was 11. I went through our, our, our elementary school. I, you know, I learned all of the things that we believe and that the Bible teaches. And, but that's all head knowledge. That's all being able to answer the questions, you know, on the test. That has nothing to do with what's going on in your relationship, in your walk, in your heart, in your trust and faith. And when it finally dawned on me that at sundown on Friday night, I could let it all go. I could turn off my cell phone, turn off Hollywood, let it go and just rest in the sure knowledge that, that my Savior has it all under control. <laughs> he said He would never leave me, never forsake me, always be there for me. And I can tell you, He is always there for each and every one of us. Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything that He had made, and indeed, indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. The universe was in perfect harmony and balance. Now I have a choir director here, and I'm just going to ask him the question. When we're talking about music, is harmony and balance important? Okay, for those of you who can't see him, I have agreement. He and I are in agreement. Harmony and balance are important. So what does that have to do with music? Well, Job 38, 7 tells us, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now understand, not everybody was in the choir. There were those who sang and there were those who shouted. Not everybody was in the choir. I'm a shouter. And if I ever audition with our choir, they will tell me you're a shouter. <laughs> In Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. Now we've looked at this over and over and over in Revelation. That word angel means messenger. But do you realize that that is happening right now? It's talking about me being the angel. Huh? Really? <laughs> I don't feel like an angel, I can tell you that. But that is what the verse is saying. The word angel means messenger. And today I get to be the messenger to the churches. Well, to this church and to all those who are listening on radio and watching on Facebook, to testify to you these things in the churches. And Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Look at it. I, Jesus, I am the bright and morning star. Jesus was in the choir. You remember what it said, the morning stars sang together. Jesus was in the choir. You've heard of the Gaither vocal band? If you haven't, you need to check it out on YouTube. Pretty sweet. But now we're talking about maybe Jesus and the morning stars. That, that might be the name of their group. Jesus and the morning stars. Because he was a morning star. And we're told that all the morning stars sang together. Everything was in balance except one thing. 
one angel's love wasn't finished. Now, God does everything in cycles. You can see it in the universe. You, you know, the rotation of our planet around the sun. Uh, you, you look at the atom, and you see the electrons revolving around the nucleus. Now, I can't talk about it any more than that, because I haven't studied physics any more than that. But I know there's a cycle involved. He does things that way. He does things in cycles. For that reason, I believe, can't prove this, but I believe it, the first thing God created, God's been here forever, but there had to be a first thing that he created. And the first thing he created, I believe, was Lucifer. And he was perfect. In every way. You know, with us, when we do something, we create a new machine or new piece of art or whatever, we, we may do it three or four or five or a dozen or, or a hundred times before we get it right. You know, we can start off with our drawing looking very much like something a kindergartner would do, and perhaps after a hundred times, it'll be something Michelangelo would do, maybe. So it gets better and better. But God didn't have to practice. Do you know God doesn't learn anything? What would he learn? God never has an aha moment. No, that never happens with God. He already knows. And he already does everything perfectly. And so the very first thing he did was perfect. The most beautiful angel, the most intelligent angel, the most talented angel, and we're told that he was the musician. Among the angels, he was the greatest musician. Whether he was the choir director or not, I don't know. Perhaps he was. I'm not saying that that means Eston had anything similar to what Lucifer had, especially after Lucifer went haywire. I haven't seen that in our choir leader, so I just want you to know I'm not talking about our choir leader. But he wasn't finished yet. I think God's creation started with him and then it came full circle, and it was time to end it with him. Lucifer had no created being that he could be humble to. He was the best at everything. There was nobody created that he would automatically, naturally be humble to. And without humility, love is incomplete. Love and humility have the same definition. I've told you that before. Putting the other person first, that's love. Putting the other person first, that's humility. Lucifer didn't have that yet. And as we now know, he never will. But God gave him an opportunity. God gave him a chance. God gives everybody a chance. If we are not in his kingdom it will be because we chose to not be in his kingdom. So God did something he had never done. I don't know how long never is there. I mean, Lucifer is not eternal. There, he had a beginning. So whatever that beginning was, from that time until about 6,000 years ago, he had never done this. And he did something... We have to go back before creation to understand. We have to look at just before this earth was created. And he asked Lucifer and Gabriel, the two covering cherubs, to step out of the throne room. That had never happened before. They were always there. They were privy to all the counsels of God. They interacted with every single thing that happened in the throne room. And now for the first time, God has said, I need the two of you to go outside. 
And then God planned. When I say God, I mean the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They communed with one another. I get that primarily from reading Ellen White. I can't point to a verse, but I happen to believe that she was inspired by God. Her visions were inspired. And she says that she saw this in vision. And I believe her. And the Godhead planned a new creation. There was a lot to consider. The plan of salvation was put in place. God knew the end from the beginning. He knew what would happen. But Lucifer had to have his chance. That's how love works. People look at the way things have turned out and they say, well, why did God even create Lucifer? He could see the end from the beginning. He knew what would happen. Why didn't he just skip that angel? You ever ask yourself that question? Why did he skip that angel? Why didn't he skip that angel? Oh, so you think God should just create people who will obey him? I mean, we do that. Don't we? We have robots. We have machines. <coughs> we have robots in factories that have replaced hundreds of people in the production of all kinds of things from automobiles to airplanes to tanks to I mean we have robots that will do exactly what we tell them to do you ever been tempted to fall in love with your robot well let me ask you it the other way has your robot ever extended the emotion of love towards you you see God is love and he wanted us to love he created us in his image because he gave us the capacity to love. But without free will, there is no love. There's just robots. And so no, God didn't skip that angel. He really did give us free will. But he also had to give Lucifer a chance. So he called all of the angels together. And to the assembled angelic throng he made his announcement. A new creation in his own image with the potential. Now I underlined it. You, you need to underline it in your mind. The potential. That word is important. The potential to be closer to him than any other created being. All of the angels were thrilled. I mean, that's what love does. When somebody finds a way to make themselves happier and you love them, you are thrilled, right? They were all thrilled, except one. Lucifer felt that he had been slapped in the face. He was the closest created being to God. He was on the right hand of the throne of power. Closer even than Gabriel. Who was on the left hand of the throne of power. And so now, he felt that for no reason whatsoever, God had decided to replace him. But actually, God had just given him the opportunity to be humble to the idea that someone could be closer to God than he was. Just the idea. If he had been humble to that idea, this is the greatest irony of all time. There will never be a greater irony than this. If he had been humble to the idea that he could be replaced, his humility would have been complete. His love would have been finished. And he would never have been replaced. He would always have been, he hates it when I preach this sermon, by the way. When, whenever I'm going to preach this sermon, Lucifer goes to Argentina. He, he doesn't want to hear this. Because it twists his gut to know that by his own decision, he caused the very thing that he feared. He caused himself 
and those who followed him in his rebellion to be thrown out of heaven further from God than he ever imagined he would be. And war broke out in heaven, Revelation 12, 7. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. They didn't fit anymore. It cuts both ways. Consider Enoch. Genesis 5, 21 and 22. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. He didn't fit down here anymore. Enoch didn't fit in a world under the control of the prince of darkness. And so, since he didn't fit, God took him to heaven, where he did fit. He's not the only one. Consider Elijah, 2 Kings 2.9. And so it was, when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what may I do for you before I am taken away from you. And Elisha said, please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Elijah no longer fit in down here, and he knew it. Did you catch that? He knew it. He knew he was about to be taken to heaven. And so he asked Elisha, what, what can I do for you before I go? This is another sermon, but I've got to tell you. I don't have time to flesh it out, but I got to tell you, there's tremendous symbolism here. We have called ourselves the Elijah people for more than 150 years. But Elisha is a symbol for the next generation wanting a double portion of what Elijah had. We're not going to be the Elijah generation until our children want double the spirituality that we have. And what I see is that generation after generation after generation, the children look at the parents and say, I don't want that. They see the hypocrisy. They see what we say on Saturday morning and what we do all week long. And they say, I don't want it. We're not the Elijah people yet. And we won't be until the hypocrisy is gone and our children see something that they want in their life. That's a different sermon. Elijah is a type, though, of the last generation. The ones who will be alive when Jesus comes. Who will be raptured or translated without seeing death. When we don't fit in, we're going to know it. Just like Elijah knew it, we will know it. When we don't fit in, we will know it. And Elijah is a type of you and me, a type of us. So what is Jesus waiting for? Why doesn't he come and get us? Sadly, we're more like Satan than Jesus. And I know I'm talking to Christians who bothered to come to church today or who bothered to tune us in on Facebook or on the radio. I'm talking to the best Christianity has to offer. I know that. And still, we are more like Satan than we are like Jesus. Imagine for a moment that you have a daughter that just turned 16 years of age. Anybody here got a 16-year-old daughter? How about 17? Oh, did I see a hand? All right. 16 or 17? All right. Well, we hit one on the head there. And uh, I didn't really hit you, so don't flinch. <laughs> but imagine 
and this is probably true in your family, your teenager wants a driver's license and an automobile. And you decide to go along with it. And <clears throat> you know that the first car is going to get wrecked. I mean, that's just a given. First car that a teenager has is going to be wrecked. Now, there may be exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, that's a pretty ironclad rule. First car, wrecked. That's where learning begins, is when you have that first wreck. And so, as a loving parent, you want to find the right car. One that will hold up in a wreck. That will protect your child in a wreck. This is a picture of the first car I ever owned. It's a 1956 Roadmaster Buick. It weighs over 4,000 pounds. There's no aluminum in that car. <laughs> I mean, something hits it, the thing that hits it's going to get hurt. So that's what you're looking for. You know, you want something like that. They're wanting you to buy them a Corvette. That's all fiberglass, and if it gets hit, they're dead. But this is what you want for your child, right here. And you're driving down the street, and lo and behold, you see one. And it has a for sale sign in the window. Now, we're going to pretend for a moment that this car is for sale by an elder in this church. Ah, well, I'm just going to make it Rocco. Rocco has this car for sale. And I always pick on David. Where's David? Where are you, David? Okay, David, I'm going to skip you today. And I'm going to pick on Roy. So... <clears throat> Rocco has this car for sale, and he, you know, he's like everybody else. He says, well, I know the car's worth a thousand bucks. I've, I've priced it on wherever you do that. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a sign out there that says uh, 1200 I mean, hey, somebody might pay it. And, it. and if not, you know, I can come down to a thousand, no harm done. So, Roy who has this, it's been a long time since you had a teenager that age, hadn't it? If ever. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to pick on you anyway. So Roy sees this car and he gets out and he walks around and he kicks the tires and he says, man, this is exactly what I need for my daughter. I think it's probably worth a thousand dollars. He gets on his cell phone and he looks it up. Sure enough, a thousand bucks. He says, uh, I think I'm going to offer him 800 Hey, they might take it. And if not, I can always come up, you know. So they meet. He knocks on the door. They talk about the car. And uh, Rocco says, well, I'm, I'm asking 1200 and And Roy says, well, I was thinking about offering you 800 And they're back and forth. And in a few moments, they close the deal on $1,000. No, no harm done, right? It's worth a thousand, it's sold for a thousand. But you know, I don't think that's the way Jesus would want it to be done. I, I, I don't think we're going to have cars in heaven, but if we did, I don't think that's the way it would change hands. Imagine this for a moment. Rocco looks at his car and he says, it's worth a thousand bucks, but I love my neighbors. I, I want to be sure they get a good deal. I'm only going to ask eight hundred. And then Roy comes along and he says, well, I think it's worth a thousand, but I love my neighbor. I, I want to be sure he gets a good deal. I'm going to offer him twelve hundred. And so he knocks on the door and, and uh, Rocco comes to the door and, and Roy says, hey, I see you've got a car out there. My, my daughter needs exactly what you've got and uh, I'd be willing to pay you twelve hundred for it. And Rocco says, did I get the names right? Roy says, okay. And then Rocco says, well, I only want 800. And so they argue back and forth, and in a few moments, the car changes hands for $1,000.
But you see, one car was sold by two men on their way to hell. And the other by two men who are already living in heaven. Well, they're living as though they're in heaven. Do you see that? Now, we both know that's not what would happen. If Rocco was to be loving and considerate of his neighbor and ask only 800, you know good and well that whoever stopped to buy it would offer six. Right? That's what would happen. We live in the kingdom of darkness. But are you telling me <laughs> that the difference, $200, the difference between $800 and $1,000, $200, is valuable enough to give up heaven? You would, you would give up heaven for $200? We do. We do it all the time. Because sadly, we are more like Satan than we are like Jesus. Satan was the originator of self-interest. God is love. All love flows from God. Love is simply God at work. That's all love is, God at work. And if we let God work in us, then we will live as though we are already there in his kingdom. Philippians 2.4 Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. John 13.35 By this all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. And love means putting the other first. That's what love is. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you put the other person first. Does that make it clearer? If you say it that way, it's the same thing. It's the same exact, same, same exact thing. Imagine again, I'll give you another example. It's a beautiful day, you're on a drive, and you come around this curve and there you see it. The one thing that nobody in their right mind, can pass up. It's a flea market. And aren't they fun? I mean, you go out there and they, they've got all kinds of things you didn't even know existed. Pocket knives that you didn't, you'd never seen one like that before. Hey, that's a really neat design. I, I didn't know they made one like that. And you're only asking two bucks. Hey, I got room in my pocket. There's, there's just stuff out there. Dinnerware, you know, dishes with patterns that you never saw before, and all kinds of things. And it's just so much fun to walk through and look at all that stuff and probably walk away with a few things, you know, that you caught, that caught your eye and you were intrigued by and you wound up buying them. And so I want you to imagine for a moment that you come across this one table and the guy has a display there of different kinds of dishware and, and uh, things like that. But right in the middle of the table, there is this vase. Now, we're in South Texas, so right in the middle of the table, there is this vase. <laughs> and it just so happens that you were thumbing through a book you have at home on antiques, valuable antiques. And you saw a picture of this very vase in your book. And if that is the one that you saw last night, it is worth $50,000. It's from the Ming Dynasty. Now, I know nothing about antiques, so if that, was a if that was a stupid remark, just forgive me, it's okay. I'm just trying to make a point here. It's worth $50,000, and you're kind of excited. And you pick it up, and you look, there's a little sticker on the bottom. It says $2.50. So here's the question. 
Whose bank account do you think about first? Yours or his? Because the truth is, most of us would say to him, hey, would you take two even? I'm, that's just the way we are. But I don't think Jesus would do that. You know, I can see Jesus. Correct me if I'm wrong. I can be wrong. Preachers are not always right. So correct me if I'm wrong. But I can see Jesus. And he, he picks up the base and he sees that $2.50 and he gets this smile on his face and he sets it back down. And he says, sir, I think you've made a terrible mistake. I, I was just looking in a book last night and I think you have a real treasure here. If it's what I think it is, it may be worth $50,000. Put that on a shelf somewhere. Don't sell it for $2.50. I'm going to be coming back this way again later today. I, I've got to go home. I'll pick up that book. We'll compare. We'll look at it. I, I think you've got a real treasure here. Isn't that what Jesus would do? I don't see Jesus saying, would you take two bucks? I, I don't see that. You see, we are more like Satan than we are like Jesus. You want to know why he hasn't come yet? Because he loves us. And he wants us to be more like him than like Satan. And he wants to give us time. Matthew 7, 12, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Don't miss the last part of this verse. For this is the law and the prophets. At the time Jesus said this, that was the Bible. What he was telling us was, the Bible exists for this one reason. So that we will treat people the way we want to be treated. In other words, love them. We will love them. Now, I... Just in case there's somebody here who thinks I'm going off the deep end here, let me just ask you. How many of you want to be not loved? Now, let me see all of your hands if you don't want to be loved. I'm glad there's no jokester here who's trying to be funny. You see, we all want to be loved. We all wish everybody would put our interests first and we need to do the exact same thing for them. You know, it's okay to fight. Did you know that? There's no problem with fighting. It's okay to fight if you're fighting for the other person to get their way. You know, my wife knows that I like Asian food and I know that she likes Italian food. So when we are going to go out to eat and we're not sure where to go, she, she loves me. I think she still does. And, and she fights for an Asian restaurant sometimes. <laughs> and I know that she doesn't like that so much. She likes Italian. And so I always fight for Italian. That's, that's what love does. You put the other person first. And... These are Jesus' words. You know, I'm not making this up. This is what Jesus said. This is why we have a Bible. That's it. The Bible exists for this reason. So that we will love each other. Put the other person first. Live as though we're already in heaven. Matthew 7, 12. Yes? Today is Richard's birthday. He's 73 years old. He's just a child, isn't he? Yes, could we say happy birthday? At the end. Don't let me forget. I understand we have a birthday boy in the congregation. I'm not going to say his name yet, but if he starts to sneak out, I will say it. The Bible is intended to teach us love, to put others first. Imagine a world with no self-interest, and you're imagining heaven. 
If there were no self-interest, there would be no wars. You wouldn't have locks on your doors. There wouldn't be contracts between corporations. There'd be no lawyers, no policemen, no tanks, no fighter jets, no guns. If you can imagine a world with no self-interest, you've just imagined heaven or the new earth after the millennium. Sadly, we still fit better here than we will up there. And the Holy Spirit is trying to correct that. That's the work that he does in us. If we're willing, he's able. I'm not telling you that this is what heaven demands from us. This is not what Jesus demands. This is what Jesus offers. That's why he gave us his Holy Spirit. It's why Peter says we become partakers of the divine nature when we are born again. This is not something we do to earn heaven. We couldn't. You couldn't earn heaven. You, you do everything you're able to do and you're going to fall way short. You're like the guy who went to the airport because he wanted to fly from Los Angeles to New York. And he couldn't afford a ticket. So he walked out on the runway and he thought, if I can just do this fast enough, I'll get there one day. No, you won't. You're just going to drop dead from exhaustion eventually. You can't get to heaven on your own. So it's not what God demands, it's what God offers. If we're willing, He's able. Hebrews 10, 14, For by one offering, He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Being sanctified simply means growing. If you're willing, if you're willing to change, if you're willing to grow, we have the promise here. God looks upon you as perfect if you're just willing to grow. These are, this is a description of those who will come up in the first resurrection. If we're willing to grow, he will have 1,000 years to finish growing us. And at the end of that 1,000 years, the earth will be made new and it will be given to us. The redeemed will return in the new Jerusalem at the end of 1,000 years. That's what the Bible says. 1 John 4.17 describes another group that will also be in that city. Love has been perfected among us. Oh, this is not about people growing. This is about people who are grown. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. That's what God offers. He's offering that to each and every one of us. You don't have a sin that he can't conquer. You don't have a difficulty that he can't beat in your life. This is a picture of those who are going to be translated at the end of time. At the second coming. They're, they're not going to die and be resurrected. They're going to be like Enoch. They're going to be like Elijah. They're just going to go home with him. This is what the Holy Spirit is trying to accomplish in each of our lives. And the only thing that separates one group from the other is our willingness to change quickly. It doesn't take the Holy Spirit long, but we tend to put on the brakes. We'll follow him so far and then we, we put up resistance and we'll say, I think I've given up enough for now. Leave me alone. We grew a little bit and we think we grew a lot. That's the only difference. If we're willing, he's able. And if it happens slow, it's because we put on the brakes. Not because he did. Love means we will fit in when we get to heaven. And that's the picture of those who will be translated. They actually put other people first. No exceptions. If you think I'm out on a limb here, let me read you what Moses wrote on this subject. Exodus 19, verse 5. This is just before God gives his law on Mount Sinai. 
Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. The people who are translated without seeing death will have a different situation. We talked about it the last time I was here, two weeks ago. They have access to the throne room, 24-7, 365. They actually replace, and we're going to have that slide in a moment, but they replace the position that Lucifer held in that throne room. They have full access. The rest of the redeemed, the ones who are still growing and he has to take that thousand years to finish their growth, they're still redeemed, they're still saved, they're still going to be there. But they get to be in his presence every Friday, I mean, excuse me, every Saturday, every Sabbath, and every new moon. That's what the Bible says. From one Sabbath to another, from one new moon to another, all flesh will come to worship before me, saith the Lord. The Sabbath, because our relationship is still important. After heaven, we still need to have a relationship with God. That's not going to go away. And from one new moon to another, because the tree of life produces a new fruit every month. And our eternal life is tied to that being in our diet. We must eat that fruit. And so every month, we come together. But he tells us right here, there is going to be a special group of people. You shall be a special treasure to me above all people. This is a picture of those who let him finish their growth. I'm not saying they somehow are better than everybody else. No, they're not. We're all sinners. We're all saved by grace, by faith in God, the sacrifice of Jesus. None of us deserve this. But he offers it. It's not what he demands. It's just what he offers. This group, translated without death, will replace Lucifer in the courts of heaven. We will have the access that he once had. Thus his hatred of us. We were the creation that caused him to fall. He was unwilling to be humble to the idea that we might be closer to God than he was. And because he was unwilling, guess what? The only reason you and I are going to be closer to God than any other creation, the only reason is because God became a man for our salvation. He became our brother. He paid for our sin. That's the only reason. We would not be closer to him than any other creation if Lucifer had just been humble to the idea that he could be replaced. But he wouldn't be humble. And his pride separated him from God's plan for his life for eternity. It can do that for us. Pride, thinking that we're better than somebody else. There's a good pride and a bad pride. Nothing wrong with being proud that your grandkid got an A on his test. Nothing wrong with being proud that you have a job well done. You made a piece of furniture and it came out great. That's fine. God made us to have that kind of pride. But when you have pride that tells you you're better than someone else, and there's a lot of that going on right now in the world, People looking down upon other ethnicities. That's the pride that separated Lucifer forever from the throne of God. And if we have that in our thinking, we need to pray for the miracle of the new birth. So that divinity can actually occupy the space between our ears and change the way we think. The question we must all ask and answer is a simple one. W-D-I-F. Where do I fit? That's it. 
Where do I fit? We'll never be at home in heaven until heaven is at home in us. So an even better question is this one. Where do I want to fit? If we're willing, he's able. This is not some obstacle course that we have to traverse in order to earn heaven. It's not about what we're able to do. If we want this, he is able to produce this in each of us. Nobody needs to be left out. He is able. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, He is able. You'll never commit a sin that He hasn't already paid for. Are we willing to live here and now as we will live there and then? Pray with me. Father, we're so thankful that You haven't given up on us yet. We know the time is coming when this world will be too evil. Just as it was in Noah's day, it will just be too evil to let it go on. And we're very near that time. Your prophecies are so clear. We are on the brink of eternity right now. And Lord, we pray for that miracle. If it hasn't already happened, let it happen now. Come into our hearts. Change our thinking. Give us love. You are the source of all love. We can get it from no other source. You are the only source. Give us your love for all of mankind, for all of your creation. Let us each be willing to put the other first in all parts of our lives so that your kingdom of love can shine from us. Let it shine where we live. And may that light shining through us from you draw others into your loving arms, into your plan for their life, into your kingdom forever. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.